And that's why we're here, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift him up, to worship him, and to make his name great. Amen? Wow, it's good to be back. That's all I can say. Good to have you. Well, thank you. And, uh, but before I mention a couple of things about uh, the little trip we were on uh, with Dennis uh, from Friendly Here and folks, had folks from each of the three churches, four churches now, if I count this one, I hope you'll let me count this church as one of the churches I've pastored a little bit. So we had one from each, at least one person from each of the four different churches that I've been a part of, and uh, that made the trip really exciting. But just to first thank, thank you all for having such an awesome church that when someone is gone and you don't have like a quote pastor to be in the pulpit, you've got young people in this church that can minister and share their testimony and speak and uh so we were able to listen, not to every bar, part of it, but most of it. And uh, Carson, man, what a great message, man. I like you just put it there and uh, just perfect. And uh, then Austin, your testimony and just uh, the whole service that, uh, that uh, the young people had and just took, you know, took just uh, everything. You guys are, all, God bless you. And I, there's nothing more important, I think, than raising young people to serve the Lord through the local church and, uh, and let them know this is not a place where they're learning to be perfect. Uh, someone posted on Facebook about, uh, well, we raised our child in church, but you know now they're not living for the Lord like it didn't do any good to raise them in church. We didn't raise our children in church for them to be perfect, someone went on to say. We raised them in church so that they'd know there's a God and there's a place that they can always come to that will love them, care for them, pray for them, support them, and be there for them. If they do go away from God, they'll come back because of this kind of a church. And so thank you for investing so much in the young people and being willing to open up the platform and a whole service. I just told somebody, probably ought to do that like every month at least, or at least every two months, where the young people have the service and get the opportunity to serve. So my, my heart's blessed to see that because most churches uh, that I pastor don't even didn't take the time or make the opportunity to really do that like you do it here. So I just thank God for that. And then also uh, Brother Josh and his message on the goat, okay? You have to always remember the goat, okay? And I'm one of those people that are pretty naive. I didn't know what the goat was. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned a lot from him already. And, uh, and then also, as I watched him preach, I noticed he just glanced at his notes. Man, I'm not that smart. And, uh, and so uh, he did an awesome job, just again, talking about the greatness of our God. Great is our Lord. And the greatest of all is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so thank you, Josh, uh, for that message. And just everyone here serving the way you serve, and putting the Lord first. Well, it was a very interesting trip. I always sometimes feel like my last trip to the Holy Land was the best ever. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how all the others were. The last one was the best, was the greatest ever. It was the goat, okay? And, uh, and, and it was a, a good trip. And I had the opportunity to room with Dennis and his brother, Dwayne, the three of us shared a room, and it got a little crowded, especially when the ambulance people came to take Dennis to the hospital, and he was against the wall. We had a hard time getting him out of the room. It was so crowded, and, uh, but uh, most of you know Dennis. Uh, one of the first nights we were there, he, 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 he really thought he was having a heart attack with the symptoms he's having with the different things that already he has with his heart. And, uh, and I've never been in a room in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and we're awakened thinking that he's having a heart attack. And, uh, but I wish, in a way, everyone could have experienced what we experienced, not, for me, it was, I, I don't know CPR, and I'm not gonna learn CPR, because I might have to use it. <laughs> and I would, and I, I would be too nervous to know how to use it. And, uh, and so, uh, so, but he, he woke up, he woke up a little while, we'll go through all the drama of the details, 
But finally, after about five minutes, he says to Dwayne, his brother, I'm having a heart attack. And I love what Dwayne did. Dwayne, his brother, his younger brother. Are you listening, Dennis? His younger brother. <laughs> Dwayne's his older brother. Dwayne, his older brother, just fell on his knees and threw his arms over top of, over top of Dennis and just began praying. Just began praying. He did the best thing that could happen. He prayed for him. And he kept praying for him. And so when we finally got a nurse that was with us who was really a good nurse, she came in and started giving some orders to do. The EMTs came in, did absolutely nothing. <laughs> they just looked at him. We couldn't speak to him because they didn't speak English. That didn't help any. And, uh, and so we, they finally almost like had it anyway to get him out of the room, get him to the hospital. But he ended up at probably one of the best hospitals in the Middle East which was only maybe a five-minute ride in the ambulance. It was just, it was a God thing. And everything taking care of him there was a God thing. And then it turned out not to be a heart attack, which was good, of course. And we, we thank you for your prayers. So everybody is praying uh, through that evening and that day for us there. We, we really do appreciate it. So he's back, but he's not feeling good this morning. And that's nothing to do with what happened over there. But, uh, but he's uh, not feeling good this morning. So continue to pray for Dennis as... He recovers from the trip and the sickness he has at this point. So I know he'd appreciate that. But uh, a couple of the maybe highlights, we, we started in Jordan, and, and the land of Jordan has as much biblical sites to visit as even what we call Israel has. The land of Jordan is where Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness with the people of Israel. And so we kind of started in the Old Testament, and I was just thinking, we might have been really close to the place where Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And just imagine that. And, uh, and so we left Jordan, crossed the river, the Jordan River, and went over into Israel. And maybe the highlight of the trip uh, was a couple things. In Jordan, we met with Lorna Rhodes, and today is her birthday. I wish somehow or another we could all send her a birthday note. But Lorna Rhodes is a Malaysian lady who went to the Middle East maybe about 20 years ago. And uh, I think she worked first with Catholic Charities. I could be wrong about that. But now she has an organization called Hope and Trust. Hope and Trust. And, and, uh, and, and we sat one morning and listened to her story. She showed a video and she shared different things about what she does. She works with victims that ISIS captured took from their husband, took these ladies from their husbands, from their families, and then they were sold from man to man to man to man to man. And, uh, and when you hear the evil and the atrocities of an organization like ISIS and you see it firsthand, the results of it, I'm telling you, it breaks your heart. And so we heard testimonies from these ladies. She helps rescue them. She helps take care of them. She helps them get emotional counseling spiritual help, of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we spent several hours just listening to the stories of what she's doing to help people who are really, really hurting and helping them relocate to other countries like Australia, Canada, America, and other countries. And so if you ever get a chance and, uh, and you want to help with something like that, you let us know. Uh, her support actually comes through Global Partners in Peace and Development, the organization my son and I started years ago, and her support comes through that organization. Matter of fact, people like Glenn Beck send thousands upon thousands of dollars every year uh, to uh, the Global Partners so that we can help her and work and partner with her. But it's an awesome ministry. And that's one of the first days we was there, and it just breaks your heart as you have to hear the real world that we are somewhat protected from here in America. And I guess maybe the other highlight, there's so many highlights, I couldn't name them all, but the other highlight of the trip would have been our last day when we went to the Garden Tomb. And we stand there and we look at Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Then we go to the tomb and we're listening to our guide tell all the story why he believes this is the place and uh, where you see the rock is in the opening and people were able to go into the empty tomb and look at where the body of Jesus lay but of course, <laughs> it was empty because he is not there. He is risen. And then we went to a little chapel uh, that was there, and they provided the Lord's Supper for us to take in that little chapel. It's just a small room down underneath, 
kind of like down like a, I don't know, I don't know what it would be called, but it was a chapel underneath the ground almost. And uh, we went down in that chapel and all 17 of us on our team and we began to give some testimonies and, and uh, the testimonies were just powerful. One lady on our team talked about how that uh, she was an alcoholic and, and could never get over it and was just tired of being an alcoholic and ended up going to church even though she didn't want to go and uh, she had no intention of going. But when the person asked, would you go to church with me? She said, my mind is saying, no, I'm not going to go. But her mouth said, yes, I'll go. <laughs> and she was shocked. And she went to church and she heard the gospel and she got saved. And she was thinking of suicide and thinking of taking her life. But that night she gave her life to Jesus Christ and totally, absolutely, never touched another drink after that day when Jesus came into her heart. Her life was transformed. And boy, she was so thankful for the cross and the power of the cross that can deliver from a life of alcoholism and just totally, absolutely change her life. A wonderful nurse. And then, uh, and people, I mean, by the time we finished, um, eyes were, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. We took the Lord's Supper, sang hymn after hymn after hymn, and just worshiped right there in the same place uh, where Jesus was crucified and also where he was buried and rose again the third day. That probably was the highlight, and it was the very last day of our trip there. So thank you for your prayers. I hope all of you can go back with me one day, and if you can't make it on earth physically, uh, you can can be sure that in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, you'll be able to go there. Amen? So you will eventually get there, and uh, we appreciate, again, your prayers. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I got five minutes left? Oh, he, he raised his hand like this. I thought that meant five minutes left. <laughs> okay, children, you're able to go with Ms. Amy. She has prepared a message for you all and a lesson for you today. Sometimes I really believe the message that the Lord's laid on my heart to bring maybe is the most important message I could ever preach, seriously. And uh, today I think this is one of those messages, and, and I really beg you to listen real carefully. And I'm going to look at my notes a lot. I know that. I'm not going to be like Josh and be able to remember everything I have written down. And I'm going to try to stick to my notes because if I don't stick to my notes, we'll be here a lot longer time. But uh, today we're going to talk about declaring God's glory, declaring God's glory. What is your purpose in life? What on earth, what on earth are you here for? What are you really here for? What is your life really all about? What are we to accomplish in this world and in our lives? And we'll be talking about that. And uh, I'd like to read a couple verses. Let's stand if you would. And we'll read Psalm 96 is where our text is. And the question behind it that we really want you to think about is what is your driving purpose in life? What is your driving purpose in life? What drives you? To do what you do, what motivates you more than anything else to do what you do. Psalm 96, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. And here's the key verse. Declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples 
are worthless, idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He shall judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Now, Father, help us in these next moments as we declare God's glory and as we think about what it means to us as individuals to be a part of declaring your glory to the nations, to all peoples of the world, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, to our co-workers, and to those maybe who have never one time even heard the name of Jesus Christ. You've told us to declare your glory to all the peoples of the earth. Lord, help us as a church, help us as individuals to fulfill that command that you've given us in your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This morning, if I ask you to identify and write down what you believe to be the driving purpose of your life, what or how would you answer that question? What drives you? What motivates you? What gets you up in the morning? What are you really living for? What is your purpose in life? What is your purpose in life? In Acts 13, 36, it says this about David, the king. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. He served the Lord the Lord's purpose in his own generation. You can't serve yesterday's generation. You can't say serve future generations, so to speak, but you can serve your generation, the people that are alive today in the world and that are around you. A couple years ago, Pastor Rick Warren wrote a couple of books on the subject of the purpose-driven life and the purpose-driven church. And I'm going to take some quotes from this book because I think it's so applicable to us today. And if you remember, those books became bestsellers because people were looking for what is my real purpose in life? What what am I on earth for? And here's what he writes. Nothing matters more than knowing God's purpose for your life. And nothing can compensate for not knowing them. Not success, wealth, fame, or pleasure. Without a purpose, life is motion without meaning, activity without direction, and events without reason. Without a purpose, life is trivial, petty, and pointless. The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without a purpose. When Cain sinned, his guilt disconnected him from God's presence, and God said, you'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. And that describes most people today. They're wandering through life without a purpose. And I'm convinced there are many, many Christians going to churches like this church. You're alive. You know you're alive. You have a good job. You're making some money. You're paying the bills. You're taking care of the family. But having a real purpose in your life is not really there. Without a clear purpose, you will keep changing directions. Jobs, relationships, churches, or other externals, hoping that each change will settle the confusion or fill the emptiness in your heart. You think maybe this time it will be different, but it doesn't solve your real problem, a lack of focus and purpose. Without a clear purpose, you have no foundation on which you base decisions, allocate your time, use your resources. 
You tend to make choices based on circumstances, pressures, and your mood at the moment. People who don't know their purpose try to do too much. And then that causes stress, fatigue, and conflict. And boy, don't we know it as we look at the people in the world around us today. You see, knowing your purpose gives meaning to your life. God created us to live a life that has meaning. Amen? He really has. Now, sometimes, though, people are trying other methods like astrology or psychics to discover it. Have you ever noticed the advertisements for the astrologist and the psychics on the television today? America said, forget God. We don't need him. But they're still turning to all these other things, trying to find the answers to the greatest need of their life through these psychics and astrology and the stars and whatever else they think might have some meaning. You see, without God, listen to this, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life really has no meaning. The suicide rate among teenagers today is appalling. It's beyond your imagination. Just at the high school my grandson goes to a few weeks ago, one of the 16-year-old students took his life. It breaks your heart because they're looking around and hearing, no God, you came from a monkey. No God, no purpose, no meaning. What is there really to live for when you look at what's going on around us? No wonder so many suicides. So, what should your purpose be? Now, God wants to redeem human beings from Satan, and he wants to reconcile them to himself so that we can fulfill at least five purposes that God has created for us. Here they are. And you heard this when, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to give you a test on Josh's message. So, how do you spell great? Oh, God bless you. L-O-V-E. Amen? Was that kind of your message? You said if you don't get anything else, get that. I got that. Yeah. God created us, listen, to love him. The first and great commandment. God created us to be a part of his family. God created us to become like him. God created us to serve him. And God created us to tell others about him. Declare his glory among the nations. Now, put another way, God made you to be a member of his family, a model of his character, a magnifier of his glory, a minister of his grace, and a messenger of his good news to others. Matter of fact, I hope, I hope if you can possibly go, go this Friday night to the Military Evangelism Center that Dave Mason has down in Jacksonville. I've been there, and it's an awesome place on a Friday night to see all those military people come in that room and sit there and eat a really good meal, and then you guys know Dave Mason. He just says it like it is. And he doesn't try to apologize for anything. He just opens up the Bible and he preaches the book just like it is. And he shares God's word. And they sit there with their Bibles open and they're listening. Some of them are saved. Some of them aren't saved. But it's a time that he is declaring God's glory to our military. And you can be a part of that this coming Friday night. I hope you'll do anything and everything you can to participate, at least with your prayers. If you can't go, help with some of the food. And if you can't help with the food, give some money to Amy to buy the food. <laughs> okay, but be a part of it in some way because you're helping do what God created you to do, and that is declare his glory to some people who desperately need to know who God really is. <laughs> now, I think this is interesting because while God created us, every one of us, for the same five basic purposes. The way you fulfill those purposes, the time, the place, the plan, the style, is absolutely unique. We are not going to do it all like the same way. 
And I've often thought about when God created you and he created me and he created every human being today, 8 billion people, 8 billion people on planet Earth. We're unique. Not one is exactly the same as another. Even twins have some differences for sure. Unique. And then you think of the billions of people that have lived and died on planet Earth. Every one of them unique. You know what I believe? Even though we have the five same basic purposes, to love God, live for God, serve God, tell others about God, to glorify God, guess what? God can only be glorified in a unique way because you take what God has gifted you with in your uniqueness to bring him glory. And only you can glorify God in a way that no one else can. Isn't that an awesome thought? because he created you different to do that. Now, God also designed his church, his church, this church specifically to help us fulfill these five purposes God has for our lives. He created the church to meet the five deepest needs of our lives. And that is a purpose to live for, people to live with, principles to live by, a profession to live out, and power of God to live on in our lives. You see, the purpose and the search for the purpose of life has puzzled people for thousands of years. And usually that's because most people start at the wrong starting point. They start at the wrong starting point. We ask ourselves self-centered questions like, and I, I don't know if it was Carson or maybe it was the testimony Austin was given, but they basically covered this. What do I want to be? What do I want to be? We ask kids that. What do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe we should change that. What do you think God wants you to be when you grow up? Amen? You see the difference? What should I do with my life? Like, it's my choice. I can do what I want to with my life. What are my goals, my ambitions, my dreams for my future? And I can tell you, focusing on ourselves will never reveal life's real purpose. I thought about bringing a whole message on these next three things because we are all living life on one of three levels. Now, you think about this. We're living life on one of three levels. The places I go to, in the, in, in especially in, in Southeast Asia, India and those countries, Thailand and people that we especially India, because I've walked through the slums of Bombay where we've had some orphanages and where we feed hungry kids and, and have planted a bunch of churches. But I've walked through those slums. I mean, it, it's, I've walked through the streets of Bombay and other major cities of India and the little babies are laying in the street and beggars are everywhere and people are starving Most of the world lives on the level of survival. Survival. They wake up in the morning, and you know what they're thinking? Well, I have some food to eat today. I mean, well, I have a place to sleep. Well, I have some clothes or coat to put on if it gets too cold. I mean, it's survival. Every day is survival. They're in the Middle East right now with the ISIS and and the things that are happening in Syria and, and things that are happening still in Iraq and those refugees that are flooding into Amman, Jordan, that our people had the chance to sit down with Iraqi refugees and Syrian refugees and have a meal with them. Those people, I'm telling you, they're not talk, thinking about making a bunch of money, having a nice house. They're just thinking about staying alive. Survival. And so a lot of people live on the level of survival. Now, that's, o that's overseas. In America, it's a little different. We're not thinking about survival. We're thinking about a fourth meal. <laughs> We're thinking about what restaurant are we going to eat at? We're thinking about what more things can I buy for my house? And can I have a nicer car? Can I get a better education for my kids? Uh, we're thinking about not, not survival. We're thinking about success. How can I be more successful? How can I get more things? Do more things. Be free. Retire and enjoy life. And I can tell you, I retired last year, and man, it, it's got busier for me for some reason. 
So there's that level of success, and that's where most Americans live, honestly. Most of the world's survival, people in countries like America, maybe, maybe Israel even, I'm telling you, it's a very civilized, industrial country. It's success. It's money, more money, better houses, better cars. <laughs> Matter of fact, we in Jordan ordered, when I had to get from the hospital back to the hotel, my son said the best way is to use Uber. You ever use Uber? I don't use it that much, but boy, I like it because it worked. And by the time I pushed the button on my phone that already had my credit card in it, I noticed the car picking us up was already down in the front of the hospital. We had to run, Dwayne and I run down there to get that car. And it was a nice car to take us about a 10 minute, five, 10 minute ride to the hospital. We had to do that three or four times. And one time a Tesla, Tesla, a Tesla picked us up. And you know what it cost? $2.10. $2.10. I said, pick me up again, man. I want to ride in this car. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even figure out how to open the door. The guy in the car had to reach over and pick it up. Now, I got a little nervous when it smelled like he was smoking pot. <laughs> Seriously. But he got us there. Okay. Two levels, the level of survival, a lot of the third world countries, most of the people in the world today, the level of success, but the third level is where you and I can choose to live and I almost preach the whole message on this and it's the level of significance, living a life that can make a difference for eternity. And you can choose to live that kind of life. Most Americans don't. Most church members don't, but you can. And that's what this message is about, challenging you by God's grace to say, I want to live a life on the level of significance. I want to make a difference. I want to impact and influence others for eternity. Amen. That's what this church wants to do. It wants to be a church with a purpose. We don't want to go through the motions of having Sunday school and church and programs and vacation Bible schools and just say, wow, we stayed busy. But what were we busy doing? Were we making a difference and an impact that drives us to give, to pray, to go, to do what God calls us to do, to sacrifice? Now, for years, I've said the theme of the Bible is redemption. Redemption. And the story of redemption is all through the Bible. But honestly, that's not what the Bible really is about. It's the storyline of the Bible, but the major focus of the Bible for our lives is not redemption. Redemption plays a part in it, but it's not redemption. As I looked at this over the years, these are conclusions I came to with people like A.W. Tozer and Leonard Ravenhill and others. They've been making the point for the last number of years that in Western civilization, especially in America, that we are practicing a humanistic Christianity. Did you hear what I said? We are practicing a humanistic Christianity. God has become the servant of man. God is like a jack in the box, you know, put in the quarter, turn the handle, and jack jumps up. He says, what do you want? And that's what we kind of do with God. We throw in our 10 cents in the offering, and then we want God to pop up and say, hey, I need you to heal me. I need you to help me. I need you to get me out of this mess I'm in. And God has become our servant. Our songs and worship themes and even our message themes are all about me, what God does for me. And again, Austin, I believe in and uh, Carson both touched on this in their time last Sunday. What Jesus does for me, what does the Holy Spirit do for me to make me feel good about myself, to take away my sin, my guilt, my pain, to give me a home in heaven, to give me, to give me, to give me, to give me. Humanistic, Christ, humanistic Christianity is what am I going to get out of this? You, 
People quit church all the time. You know why? Because somebody didn't pat them on the back or say hi to them or shake their hand or help them get what they thought they needed. And I'm just going to go somewhere else where I can get what I need. I hear it all the time. But that's not what church is about. I, t- I tell people, God didn't, God didn't send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to make you happy and to pursue happiness. He died on the cross to make you holy so that you can live a life that glorifies God. Amen? You see, the truth is, it's really all about God. It's all about his glory. The first verse of the Bible lays the foundation for this truth. In the beginning, God. Did you hear that? Let's say it together. In the beginning, yeah, God. It's really all about God. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, says it's all about his glory. Revelation 4.11, you're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. The Puritan fathers in the Westminster Catechism said it this way, what is the chief purpose for which man is made? And the answer, the chief purpose for which man is made is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, John Piper did it a little better. He added, what is the chief end of God? And you know what the answer is? And this is scriptural. The chief end of God himself is to glorify God and to enjoy himself forever. Have you ever thought about that? You'll see some verses here in a few minutes. Another way to say it simply, God is righteous. God is righteous. The opposite of righteousness, now listen real careful. The opposite of righteousness, and boy, when you read through the scriptures, you read about the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God, the Psalms, the Proverbs, righteousness, righteousness. God is a righteous God. We read that over and again. The opposite of righteousness is to value and enjoy what is not truly valuable or rewarding. That's why when you read Romans 1.18, people are unrighteous. Why? Because they have suppressed the truth of God's value. They've exchanged God for created things. They belittle God and discredit his worth. That's unrighteousness. Righteousness is just the opposite. It means recognizing true value for what it is, esteeming it and enjoying it in proportion to its true worth. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, we are told the unrighteous will perish because they refuse to love the truth. The righteous then are those who welcome a love for the truth. Righteousness is recognizing and welcoming and loving and upholding that which is truly valuable. And let me tell you what is truly valuable right here, this book, the Bible. What is really valuable is God, his word, his son, his Holy Spirit. That's what's valuable. And when you really uphold the truth of his word, his son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and you live a life valuing that, you will live a righteous life that you will really enjoy life. God is righteous. This means he recognizes, he welcomes, he loves, he upholds with infinite jealousy and energy what is infinitely valuable, namely the worth of God himself. God's righteous passion and delight is to display and uphold his infinite, valuable glory. And this is not just a vague theological conjecture. It flows from dozens of Bible texts that shows that God is in the relentless pursuit of praise and honor from creation to consummation. Listen to this verse. I hope it shows up on the screen. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. Listen to what God says. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you. 
that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profane? My glory I will not give to another. Man, that says it so clearly. The most passionate heart for the glorification of God is God's own heart. God's ultimate goal is to uphold and display the glory of his name. Read the scriptures over and again. That's what it's about. Verse after verse after verse in the Bible attest to this great truth. It's all about the glory of God. God chose his people for his glory. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise, listen to this, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Isaiah 43, 6 through 7, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Wow. God instructs us to do everything for his glory. Everything. Everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, what does it say? Say, do it, say it with me. Do all to the glory of God. Isn't that what it says? So I'm not making this up, <laughs> okay? I'm not just trying to have a message. If you get this point, everything is for the glory of God and everything you do should be for the glory of God. That should be the driving purpose of your life, to glorify him in every aspect of your life. Amen? Even your sleep should be for the glory of God so you can get up the next morning and serve him the way you should serve him. Amen? Oh, I love this statement. I think Piper's the one that probably coined it from what I understand today. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Do I need to say it again? Is it on the screen? Today, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I'll tell you what, when you really get satisfied in Jesus, it really won't happen, it really won't matter what you have, what you don't have, and what else, else is happening around you. And I could, I with tears would tell you the stories and the people I've met who have suffered, who've been in prison, who've been beaten, who are willing to be burned at the stake, and they were satisfied because they had Jesus Christ, and they were satisfied in him. So how do we display God's glory? So we're getting close to the end. How do we display God's glory? Now, God's radiant glory is associated with his presence, and you know that. In Moses, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17 through 23, so the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've spoken, for you found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, please, please show me your glory. And God said, well, I'll make my goodness pass before you and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I'll be gracious on whom I'll be gracious. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And the Lord said, here's a place, for, here's a place by me. You shall stand on the rock. And so it shall be while my glory passes by that I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by then I'll take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And so Moses, God removed the hand, and you know what he saw? He saw the glory of God. Why? The glory of God is the manifest presence of God. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus said, I'm there. 
I think one of the most glorious things that could happen is when you come to church and you come together with God's people, you sense his presence. When we were in the upper room, when we were in the Garden of Gethsemane, when we were in that tomb, that place where Jesus was buried in that little chapel, there was the overwhelming sense of God's presence and people wept and cried and fell on their face. One young girl, she fell on her face face and just bald tear. I mean, we, I mean, it was moving because God's presence was so real. The manifest presence of God is the glory of God. God showed up and his radiant glory was unveiled when the tabernacle was set up and the pillar of fire by night came upon it. And the pillar of cloud by day was upon that tabernacle. That was the presence of God coming up out of the cherubims over the mercy seat, over the Ark of the Covenant from the most holy place. It was called the Shekinah glory of cloud of God, the, the visible manifestation of God on earth. The burning bush, God shows up and he says, take off your shoes, Moses, your own holy ground. The temple, when Solomon dedicated it, the glory of God so fills the temple, the priest can't go into it. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the unveiling of God's glory and his presence. In John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the unveiling of of God's manifest glory. And now in us, look in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God now dwells in us. In every believer, because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. Boy, if we could only really begin to believe and understand and comprehend what that really means every moment of every day for the believer, the glory of God dwells in you. We are the light of the world, Jesus told us. And I'm telling you, the darker it gets outside, the more opportunity we have as light to shed light into that darkness to show people who God really, really is. So what is the practical way that you and I can unveil the glory of God today? Now, remember God's original creation, and, and hang with me for a few moments, because where I got this from, I have no idea, but I'm telling you, it's really good. God created everything with diversity, everything with diversity, original creation. But originally, it was diversity with unity, harmony, order, peace with everything in perfect sync with God himself and everything else. We had some men come to our church a few years ago who began to share about the holy dance of God and how God wants us to join him, his son, and his Holy Spirit in a holy dance and be a part of that glory that God want in perfect sync with God. Everything was in sync. The stars, the constellations, the universe, the plants, the animal life. It was diversity with unity and harmony. The lion and the lamb would lay down together. Men and women, diverse, different, but one in unity with God. Can you imagine what it was for Adam and Eve in the garden before sin entered the picture? Beyond our imagination almost, because sin entered the picture, corrupted and disturbed everything. Disorder, hatred, jealousy, envy, covetousness, greed, selfishness, chaos entered the world, and Cain kills Abel. But God's grace and God's redemption has the power to restore, to recreate, to bring harmony, love, and peace to what sin has corrupted. So when a lost, hell-bent, hell-bound sinner is transformed by God's grace of redemption through the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ, the glory of God is revealed. 
Man, I've seen it. You've seen it. I've seen the alcoholics. I've seen the drugs. I've seen the, 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 uh, the, the drug addicts. I've, I've seen them bow their head with tears, confess their sin. And when they receive that redemptive work of the blood of the cross of Christ, the glory of God appears. <laughs> and if we play a part in this miracle, I can tell you this, it becomes our greatest joy. I guarantee you, my greatest joy is not that I preached one time maybe to 10,000 people in India. My greatest joy is not that I can say I pastored four great churches. My greatest joy is being with someone when they say, God, with a broken heart, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I am there when a sinner has his eyes open to who Jesus really is. And salvation takes place. And their life is forever changed. That's why when that lady said, I was an alcoholic, I was contemplating suicide, but I heard the story of Jesus. And that neighbor who invited her to church happened to be there. I'm telling you, that neighbor played a part in that miracle. Can you imagine the joy of that neighbor that still looks back and thinks, I'm so glad I invited her to church with me that day. <laughs> Even though I love what Doris said, that nurse, she said, I had no intention of going to church. And when she asked me, my mind said, no, I'm not going to church. But when I opened my mouth, I said, yeah, I'll go with you. Because <laughs> God was at work. And when God's at work, oh, my friend, what a joy. Listen, listen, listen. When a man or wife, when a man and a wife have fallen out of love, and they're restored by God's grace and power, and they forgive and begin to love one another again, God's glory is unveiled. And if you played a part in that miracle, it's your greatest joy. And I'm telling you, I've had that, I've been a part of that time after time after time over the years. And the opportunity to marry, remarry couples who've been divorced for years. And I could tell you personal stories and to stand at that altar and they look at each other and forgive each other and come back together as husband and wife. Wow. And today, love each other, care for each other. It becomes your greatest joy. When two neighbors who hate each other are restored by God's grace and redemption, God's glory is unveiled. And if we played a part in that miracle, it becomes our greatest joy. So how can we be a part of God's great plan for his glory to be proclaimed to the nations? And I'm almost done, so hang with me a couple more minutes. In Genesis 11, God divided the peoples of the earth into at least 70 nations, diversely created instantly without unity, the Tower of Babel. You know the story. And the people of the earth were scattered to the far ends of the earth. Now, God's desire is for his glory to fill the whole earth with all nations, people groups worshiping him in unity. Jesus showed us this in John chapter 4, remember? Jesus is a Jew. The lady at the well, she's a what? Samaritan. They have no part to do with each other. And she's a woman, and he's a man. But what did Jesus do? He showed up and he revealed God's glory to her. He revealed God's salvation. He said, the Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And she came to know Jesus, and she goes back to that town. That whole town comes out and believe on him that she introduced them to. It's all about God and his son, Jesus Christ. You see, God's word makes a great deal about worship in heaven, diversity with unity because of redemption. Romans, Revelations 5, 9, they sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and nation have been bought. Revelation 14, 6 through 7, I saw another angel flying, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. You see... Jesus glorified God 
as he submitted to the will of God to fill the great work of redemption because of his own blood being shed on the cross. So what is God's great purpose on earth today? God is glorified as the people groups of the world experience his salvation and redemption through Jesus Christ, and they begin to worship him. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. I can tell you, our greatest joy, and this has been a great joy that God put in my heart years ago as a young believer, that is to join God into taking his wonderful story of love and grace, redemption, forgiveness of sins, true eternal life to people who would have never, ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ if someone hadn't prayed, someone hadn't given, and someone hadn't gone. And to be a part of that is a tremendous fulfillment of purpose in life. On our trip, in that room where we had the Lord's Supper at the garden, where Jesus was crucified and where he was laid and he rose again, my sister-in-law was with us, Renee Grooms. When we were at the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a church there, the Rock of Agonies in there where Jesus prayed by himself, and the team had gone in there. Renee was praying, and her prayer was, God, I feel like you want me to witness to our guide who's been with us for a whole week. I feel like you want me to witness to him. And so she just prayed that the opportunity would come, and she could, and sure enough, he walked out by himself, and she had an opportunity to get alongside of him. And she said to him, she said, Ferris, I, I don't want to be offensive or anything like that, but I just feel like this is so much on my heart. She said, I just got to ask you, do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? She said, obviously, you know the Bible because he's been taking us. He lives there. He's taking us Bible places. He's showing us Bible verses. He's telling Bible stories. She said, but do you have him in your heart? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? And he looked at her. And he says, I really believe I do. I really believe I have him in my heart. And then he began to weep, tears, crying. I mean, profusely. She begins to weep. And he looks at her and says, you're the first person, though, who has ever taken the time to ask me that I know in my life. What a joy for her, but what a tragedy that some preacher like me didn't take the time to ask him or someone else but all the Christians that have surrounded him. We get so busy, what am I going to see and forget people all around us need Jesus Christ. I can tell you, when she shared that story as we were taking communion, the tears flowed again. Remember our text? Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised He's to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the nations, the Lord reigns. How do you do it? You bring the offering of yourself to the Lord. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you make your lives, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And you join God. Join God in the great purpose of glorifying him by bringing the message of redemption to people, groups, all around the world. You know, today they're estimated to be 16,448 distinct people groups in the world. Distinct. Eight billion people. But they tell us over 3.8 billion of those people have never heard one time the name of Jesus Christ. 3.8 billion people on planet Earth have never heard the name of Jesus. Out of those 16,000 plus distinct people groups, they're still saying over 3,000 of them are unengaged, 
and unreached, meaning there's no viable work going on where they're at. I can tell you about the Katag people in Dagestan. I have their name in my Bible. I carry it about with me. Every week, at least one time a week, I pray for the Katag. There are 20,000 people in nine villages in the, and this is southern Russia, in the country, in the, the, the county or state of Dagestan, Russia. No believers, no believers, no one to tell them about Jesus Christ. A difficult place to access for a lot of reasons. Right now, I'm not getting on a plane and going to Russia, I can tell you. Okay, maybe I should be bold enough to try. Right now, God hadn't given me grace or direction to do that. But these people are lost without any hope. And without Christ, they will perish unless someone, someone gets the gospel. I pray for them every week, 21,000 people. Matter of fact, I have a different group of people. I have it right here in the front of my Bible. On Sunday, I pray for the Mina. And I've been there many, many times in India, almost 5 million MENA people. I've walked around their villages. I've walked through their villages. I've talked to these people. I've witnessed to these people. But 4 million of them, an unenriched people group. We've planted churches now, and over the years, we've watched God do awesome things in that people group. The Balkar, 81,000 people in this people group, Muslims, and they need Christ in southern Russia in the Caucasus. The Banjari people, 5 million, 676 million of these people in India. And I've been in their villages. We planted some churches there. But they need prayer and they need Christ and they need the gospel. The Chinchu people, only 70,000 people. These are woods people. They work in the woods. They work, live in the back country of India. They need Christ. The Koya people, 783,000 of these people live along the river, sacrificing children to their gods, and they need Jesus desperately. And we know a handful of believers there. We have a medical clinic in the middle of one of their villages. The Graja Granda people on the other side of India, 392,000 people on Friday. And then the Katag people I pray for on Saturday. Every day, a different people group. What can you do? What can you do? You can pray. Get a name of a one people group at least and say, I want to pray for that people group. All you have to do is look up the Joshua Project on your computer and it'll tell you who these groups are, how many they are, how much gospel or access they have. You can pray that God's glory would be brought to those people in the redemptive power of the cross of Jesus Christ. And God will answer your prayer. He's waiting for someone to stand in the gap and pray. You can give. Give to missions. Give to missions over and above your tithes and offerings and your gifts to the church. Pray, God, what would you have me to give to help people go share that good news? There has to be senders. There has to be prayers. And then there has to be people who will say, here I am, Lord, send me. You can go. Pray that your sons and your daughters and children and over the years, we could tell you dozens and dozens of people in the churches that we've pastored have gone to the jungles of Venezuela where these head-hunting, cannibalistic people have lived, the Yanomama, and today many of them know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And our friends, and my son has even been down there amongst them. And I'm telling you, there's no greater joy to know than that you have joined God in declaring his glory among the nations and fulfilling that verse. Remember 1 Corinthians 10:31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so the question is, are you living a life of purpose? Are you driven with this great purpose to make his name famous? To make his name famous? I, I could tell you about the Moravians. These dear people in, I think it was the 16th century, 17th century in Europe, they had a prayer meeting that lasted 100 years. And God began to move amongst them. Zinzendorf in this place he had there in Germany. And these Moravians, some of them heard the call of God, and they literally sold themselves into slavery to go to the West Indies to become someone that could share the gospel with the other slaves there. Would you be willing to do that? I'm not so sure most of us would be, but they were. And you read the stories of how they gave their lives. Why? 
because they believed that they were to declare his glory among the nations. Let's pray. Father, this church is here for the glory of God above all other purposes, to glorify you, to make your name great. And it begins right here in this place with our hearts being dedicated and consecrated, hating that which is evil, loving that which is good, teaching our children, our grandchildren to love you with all their heart, their soul, their mind, their might, to love with the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you gave your all. And as we stood there next to Calvary this past week, and we thought about the sacrifice you made, it overwhelmed us once again. And we should be overwhelmed by it every day to think there are so many people that have never heard of that sacrifice you made so that they could find real life, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. Lord, help us to be a church with purpose. Help us to be a people, individuals with purpose. Live a life of significance that makes a difference for eternity in the lives of those around us. So Lord, I, I just ask, I prayed before we came today that this message would be an impacting message because your Holy Spirit takes it and places it in the heart of everyone here to pray, to pray, to surrender, to dedicate, to consecrate, and to determine to live a life of purpose, not a meaningless life just trying to keep up with the Joneses next door. Oh, God, please help us. Lord, raise up missionaries out of this church who will go tell people like the Katag people of Dagestan who have never, ever heard. People who will be willing to make the sacrifice. Lord, I thank you for all the friends and close friends I have that, Lord, are right now overseas serving you, some who are close to death, even because of where they're serving and lack of medical care and things. Lord, please, 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 God, help us to be willing to do what we can do on this end, to pray for them, to give, and if you call us to go. Now, as the Lord speak into your heart, in these next couple moments, before we close in prayer, would you say, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me, help me to not live a selfish, self-centered life, humanistic Christianity, but live a life totally surrendered and dedicated to your purposes. Oh, Lord, help me, I pray. Never, ever have I read through the New Testament and found that you can halfway serve God. Not, not, never, it's not there. It's total, total, absolute surrender to him and his will. Not my life, but his life. I heard the young people last week talk about that right here from this pulpit. Father, I thank you for what you're doing here at Friendly Community Church. You brought me here in a very miraculous, unusual way. And I thank you for feeling so accepted and loved by these dear people. Edith and I just thank God for this church. And Lord, we believe you have a purpose for us being here to, to encourage, to exhort, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. It's getting awful dark outside, spiritually all around us, Lord. And help this church to be a light to this community and to the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. I'll guarantee you it's dark outside when you leave today. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.